questions and should be brief. The front bench may also take part in questioning. Dr Dan Poulter. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I would first like to draw the House's attention to my declaration of members' interest as a practising uh, NHS uh, psychiatrist. The Joint Committee on the Draft Mental Health Bill was formed on the 4th of July 2022 to scrutinise this important and urgently needed reform of mental health legislation. Our committee has been working hard since that date. We held 21 committee meetings in just over 12 sitting weeks. We spoke with over 50 witnesses, received over 100 submissions of written evidence and engaged with affected communities through surveys, roundtables and a visit to the mental health unit at Lambeth Hospital. We are very grateful to everyone who took the time to contribute to our inquiry, to the officials and ministers of the Department of Health and Social Care for their engagement with our work, and to our specialist uh, advisers and secretariat. Working on the Joint Committee was a collaborative process as we worked together through this complex topic uh, and learned from each other's expertise. Of course, there were differences of opinion, which may be reflected in later debates in this place. However, the fact that we felt it important to agree the report unanimously is a testament to the Committee's dedication to getting this once-in-a-generation piece of legislation onto the statute books. Our work was supported by an excellent team of officials and clerks from both Houses, um, and the Committee are very grateful for their expertise and support in all of our work and in compiling the report. Um, this Mental Health Bill has, Mr Deputy Speaker, been much anticipated. Detention rates under the Mental Health Act are rising, and there are a disproportionate number of people from uh, black and ethnic minority communities being detained. Our attitude as a society towards mental health has also changed, and reform is needed. We welcome the principles contained within this draft bill. It introduces important reforms to improve patient choice, bring down detentions, and reduce racial inequality. In our inquiry, we heard concerns about Im around implementation, resourcing and possible unintended consequences of the proposed legislation. Our recommendations address these concerns and are intended to make this important bill stronger and more workable. However, the process of mental health reform cannot stop or even pause with this bill. There needs to be further consideration of fusion legislation of the mental health and mental capacity laws. During our evidence, it became apparent that someone needs to drive mental health reform on behalf of patients, families and carers. We have recommended the creation of a mental health commissioner to oversee this process and to challenge the stigma that still ex exists around serious and enduring mental illness. Proper resourcing and implementation will be crucial for these changes to work. Mental health services are under enormous pressure and significant changes and improvements are needed to provide high quality community alternatives to inpatient care particularly in ensuring there will be sufficient workforce to deliver the proposed changes. We welcome commitments from the Government to increase spending on health and social care, but most people we spoke to, including mental health providers, were still unconvinced that current resourcing or workforce plans are adequate. The Government must publish a detailed plan for resourcing and implementation of the introduction of the Bill, including the implications for the workforce, and it should report annually to Parliament on its progress against this plan. The Independent Review structured their work around four key principles that should, share, that should shape care and treatment under the Mental Health Act. These principles were choice and autonomy, least restriction, therapeutic benefit and the person as an individual. These principles should be included on the face of the Bill to ensure they endure and become a driver of cultural change. Tackling racial inequalities in the use of the Mental Health Act must be at the core of the reform. Black people are four times more likely to be detained under the Mental Health Act than white people and 11 times more likely to be given a community treatment order. These figures are rising. There has been a collective failure to address this issue and we now feel the time has come for this to be addressed. Understanding of racial inequality must be included in the Bill. There must be a responsible person in every health organisation to monitor data on inequalities and oversee policies for change. We heard evidence that community treatment orders are ineffective for most patients and disproportionately used for black patients. We have therefore recommended that they are abolished for civil patients and reviewed for use with forensic patients. On the important issue of the detention criteria, the draft bill makes changes to the grounds on which someone can be detained for assessment and treatment with the intention of moving away from risk-based 
risk-based model and ensuring that detention will benefit the patient. Accountability is welcome, but we heard that it may lead to people being detained, uh, uh, being denied the help um, that they need when they most needed it, particularly patients with psychotic illnesses and those with chronic and enduring mental illness. We recommend some changes to the criteria and greater guidance in the code of practice to prevent this. Too many autistic people and people with learning disabilities are being detained in inappropriate mental health facilities and for too long. Change to the way that mental the Mental Health Act works for patients with learning disabilities and autism is also long overdue. The Government's intention to address this by removing learning disabilities and autism as conditions which can justify long-term detention under Section 3 of the Mental Health Act may lead to benefits in the longer term. However, we heard that without proper implementation, these changes could make the situation worse and potential displacement of people with learning disabilities into the criminal justice system could occur. There must be improvements in community care before people with learning disabilities and autistic people can be supported to live in the community. It is vital that reforms are not implemented until this is achieved. Another pressing risk is that these communities may be detained instead under different legal powers and possibly criminalised. This would be the opposite of what the change is intended to achieve. The Government must address this risk before the changes are implemented. We have therefore recommended the introduction of a tightly defined power to allow for longer detention periods in exceptional circumstances with strong safeguards in place to prevent this happening unnecessarily. On patient choice, patients should be able to make choices about their care and treatment. The draft bill makes welcome changes in this area but does not follow through on a white paper commitment to give patients statutory rights to request an advanced choice document. We heard almost, all, almost unanimous evidence supporting advanced choice documents, making, advanced choices, um, um, our, making our recommendation that advanced choices should be a statutory right. On children and young people, following the COVID-19 pandemic, the numbers of children and young people experiencing mental distress has risen dramatically. Children and young people continue to be placed in adult wards or in hospitals far from home due to the lack of appropriate care placements. This draft bill misses a crucial opportunity to address this. We also believe that children should benefit from stronger protections in the draft bill which support patient choice. This is a complex area and the Government needs to carefully think through its proposals, consulting further where necessary about this bill and how it will interact with the Children's Act. So, In conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is 40 years since the uh, 1983 Mental Health Act. This draft bill is needed. If the Government is willing to address our concerns in the ways we have suggested, it can make an important contribution to the modernisation of mental health legislation. Within our suggested amendments, we hope that the Government now acts swiftly to introduce the Bill to Parliament in this session so it can then be further scrutinised and improved by Parliament. Hello, Minister Dr. Rosina Allen Carr. Thank yeah, you, Madam yeah. Deputy Speaker. Firstly, I would like to thank all those patients, campaigners and experts who provided evidence to the Joint Committee, and a special thank you to Alexis Quinn, whose account of her own lived experiences with autism touched many committee members. I would also like to thank the committee and the members for what was an incredibly valuable experience and a true example of when cross-party working goes really, really well. I am honoured to have worked on a once-in-a-generation opportunity to improve the rights of patients experiencing a mental health crisis and to tackle the health inequalities enshrined in current legislation. For years, the Government kicked updating this legislation into the long grass, and now the current draft bill still does not go far enough to tackle the health inequalities and racial disparities of those detained under the Mental Health Act. I hope the Honourable Member for uh, Central Suffolk and North Ipswich will agree with me that the Government should put patient voices at the heart of this legislation and take the Joint Committee's recommendations on board. Yeah, yeah. Can I um, formally, uh, on behalf of uh, the Committee, uh, thank um, uh, my Honourable Friend, the Honourable Member for uh, uh, Tooting, for, um, and the Shadow Minister, for all of uh, her work. It's, I think it was, we were lucky that we had um, uh, her own professional expertise um, as a frontline clinician um, to add to the important scrutiny work that we did. Um, and uh, I certainly uh, would agree that uh, 
that uh, given that it's been 40 years since we've had uh, any modifications or changes to the Mental Health Act, the time has come to put into place um, uh, those changes in a bill. Um, and we would very much urge, I'm sure all of the committee, that the government takes on board uh, our well-intentioned uh, uh, recommendations and concerns uh, to strengthen the bill uh, and that we can continue to see a cross-party collaborative process in improving uh, mental health care for, um, for the patients uh, who most need it. Uh, Minister Wilkins. Well, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I would uh, like to sincerely thank my honourable friend, the Member for Central Suffolk and North Ipswich, and of course the Committee for all of the work that has been put into this constructive and important report, and of course thank all those who gave evidence to the Committee. The Government is of course now considering the, bills, uh, the, sorry, the Committee's recommendations about how we can further improve the Bill and modernise the Mental Health Act. My honourable friend, the member for Lewis, the Minister for Mental Health, gave evidence to the committee back in November, alongside my right honourable friend, the member for East Hampshire, the Minister of State for Prisons, Parole and Probation at the Ministry of Justice. And I'm grateful to see the final report reflect the support these reforms have on all sides of this House and acknowledge that the committee has clearly engaged fully with the complexities involved in this work. It is now the Government's intention to take the next steps in getting this legislation right so that people with severe mental health needs get the help and support they, when they need it and with the rights, uh, their rights and dignity better respected. It is vital too that we continue to progress the work we have started with NHS England and of course others to address the racial disparities that have for too long been associated with the use of the Act. Through you, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would ask, does my honourable friend, the member for Central Suffolk and North Ipswich, agree that the reforms proposed in the Mental Health Bill provide for an improved framework in which people experiencing the most serious mental health conditions will have far more choice and influence over their treatment? I uh, agree with the, the, the Minister, and uh, he, he's, uh, he's right to suggest that this is an important uh, step forward. Um, this piece of legislation will make a significant difference to pace it, patients, but it is part of a process, um, not the end of uh, a journey. And in particular, uh, I would uh, draw the, uh, uh, on behalf of the committee, the government's attention to the potential unintended consequences and some of the well-meaning uh, changes being proposed relating to um, alert patients with learning disabilities and autism, uh, and also for uh, potentially changing the grounds for uh, detention, uh, with, with the uh, unintended consequence perhaps being that sometimes the patients, those with, who are the most unwell with chronic and enduring mental illness and psychotic conditions, it may be harder to detain those patients. And I would hope that uh, the government will take on board those concerns, uh, look at those, and ensure that uh, what comes back to this place uh, is uh, a stronger bill. Um, that uh, works uh, very much in the best interests of patients. Fleur Anderson. Thank you, Madam Deputy yeah, Speaker. Yeah. I welcome this report and the highlighting in particular of the racial inequalities that have been highlighted in my constituency by organisations such as the Wandsworth Community Empowerment Network for many years. Is the member for Central Suffolk and North Ipswich optimistic from hearing from all of the organisations and the evidence that the inequalities affecting black and minority ethnic groups, and especially in terms of the culture and the policy, will be improved? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic if the government adopts the, the recommendations that we've made that we will have, that we will have a bill that's much stronger uh, in uh, recognising that we need to uh, improve uh, the care that is, uh, that is uh, available um, to all patients, but in particular that will deal with some of the uh, racial disparities that we currently see in the implementation of the Mental Health Act. In particular, um, we know that, um, uh, that uh, black, um, black people, but particularly black men, are disproportionately detained under the Mental Health Act. They're disproportionately likely to receive uh, a community treatment order or a CTO, um, uh, as I would term it in, in a professional um, a jargon. Um, and there is a disproportionate use of uh, depot medication um, for, uh, again, once again, amongst black men, and that has um, caused um, a broken down. That has caused. Uh, challenges in building therapeutic relationships and building trust with black communities um, across 
um, uh, across London and elsewhere, um, and that's got to be put right. So we put in place um, some recommendations. For example, we believe actually the evidence for CTOs um, is, is weak for all patients, and actually um, there's obviously a disproportionate use of CTOs amongst uh, the black community, Therefore, we've, we have said that we think community treatment orders should not be applied in the civil part of the bill. We've also put in place um, recommendations for greater monitoring of how mental health legislation is used in each mental health provider um, to ensure that, these, these, the, this is, this is at this, that there's a proper um, understanding um, for providers, be they in London or elsewhere, about how the mental health legislation is used. Um, and uh, hopefully that can start the process then of rebuilding trust with communities, particularly the black community, uh, where uh, trust with mental health providers um, has been lost in the past. Dr Ben Spencer. Thank you, and Madam Deputy Speaker, and I draw the House's attention to my range of interests in this area, which were declared um, in the, uh, as part of the um, State Committee report that's gone out. Um, can I um, join uh, my honourable friend and thank him for his statement and join him in thanking all involved um, in this committee um, in particular the clerks and the staff involved who are absolutely, uh, absolutely fantastic uh, in supporting us uh, pulling this report together. Um, we, it, we, every 20 years or so, we go for a process um, at looking at reviewing uh, our mental health legislation. Uh, and I'm so delighted uh, the work that's been put forward over the past few years, both in terms of the, the Wesley Review Panel, but you know, driven by the government in terms of making real changes uh, in this very important area of law. Um, notwithstanding the huge step forwards that this uh, bill and hopefully act will, will make in this, in this area, does my new friend agree with me that this really is the beginning of a journey going forwards of continuous reform rather than the, the end point? Dr. Dan Poulter. I, 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 you know, I, the committee were very lucky and very great, very, very lucky that we had the professional expertise of uh, my honourable friend, um, my honourable friend, the member for uh, Tooting, um, and in the other place from uh, a former president of the Royal College, and indeed some very distinguished lawyers. Um, and I know this is an issue that he has taken uh, great interest in uh, and for many years. Um, but he's right. This is the beginning of a, a process, not an end in itself, um, and there is much that the committee recognised needed to be done uh, in the future and in for a, a future government to look at in bringing fusion between mental capacity law and mental health law, and I know that's something that he was a great advocate of uh, throughout our work. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I, first of all, thank the uh, Select Committee for their recommendations, in particular the Honourable Gentleman for Central Suffolk and North Ipswich for his, his presentation this morning. I, I think each and every one of us recognise the, the importance of the recommendations, so my question to the Honourable Gentleman is this. Uh, the, these uh, um, um, recommendations for both patients and also for staff will be uh, commended or should be commended to all of the devolved administrations, in particular to the Northern Ireland Assembly, where, where health is devolved. Can I ask him, the, the Honourable Gentleman, will that happen? And, and if not, could he make sure that it does? Thank you. I th thank the, uh, the uh, Honourable Member for Strangford for his, his question. <coughs> I think we, we actually looked, as part of our work, at at uh, elements of, of reform that are being considered across the devolved administrations, and on the issue we previously that, that was previously raised um, about fusion of mental health and mental capacity law, that's something that's being already well underway in Northern Ireland. So it may be the case that it's a question of uh, the UK Parliament learning from the Northern Ireland Assembly uh, rather than. Uh, the other way round, and uh, we will, I'm sure, in this place, continue to watch with interest um, proposed changes to uh, the legislation in uh, in Northern Ireland and how that may help to improve what we do when we look at that in the future. Um, I hope uh, at, at fusion of mental health and mental capacity law. Uh, I thank the honourable member uh, for his 